capacity. Please stand up and let everybody see who you are. Okay. You'll be hearing many of their stories. Yeah, it's okay to give them applause. So I hope you got a chance to get the handout at the table, uh, which uh, will give you a lot of basic information about CITE. And uh, also will link you to, to more information. Uh, what we want to try and do here today is, for the next 45 minutes, we want to share our story with you and then uh, have a question and answer where uh, we hope that, that your reactions to the story will help us learn and uh, will help inspire us to keep going in year two. CITE is a two-year project. We have just completed year one, and so we're anxious to share with you some ideas about how things have gone and what lies ahead for us, so thank you all. Um, we want to start with making sure that everybody is aware of and has some feel for the community that CITE is situated in, which is Salinas, California. And we don't want to assume that knowledge, and so we've asked Chago Juarez of our cohort member, Building Healthy Communities, to share a little bit about the story of Salinas. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So in order for us to help you understand Salinas today, we need to go back a number of years, like quite a few actually, 12,000 years, when the Esalen peoples uh, began to take care of this land that we, we know as Salinas, but they called Ensign. <laughs> Salinas is, has been the home of those who, who plant, pick, and package over 150 crops, at producing about 60% of the national, like, national production of produce, of, those, of, the, of the stuff that we find in our, in our supermarkets, right? Like your leafy greens, broccoli, celery, uh, artichoke, strawberries, and la mora, blackberries, which is what Ensign stands for, stands for the, the land of the blackberry brambles. And, but today's ag industry, um, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't be anything, not not just without the Esalen, but but without the Chinese that came during the 1850s, and they brought their technology, the technology of the of the row crop systems, of being able to drain the the, the marshy swamp lands that are called that were called Salinas for that reason. But if by 1880s, after 30 years of, of the statehood the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And that, put a, that disrupted the, their contribution, their participation, their role in that. Next up, the Japanese. The Japanese were the immigrant labor that came from the East. And they, they surpassed the American expectation and got to a point where they were, they were able to, to purchase their own farmland, run their own businesses, but by 1907, they passed something called the, Gen the Gentleman's Agreement, and that, too, put an end to that. Next, next were, were the Filipino. The Filipino who had just gone through a war against Spain and then a war against the United States found themselves now immigrating into the US and you know, bringing that, that labor force about 40% of the Salinas Valley labor force, actually. But during a time when they started becoming criminalized as well, all of that forced them to, to form one of the first farm labor unions in the country, the Filipino Labor Union, the FLU. That was, that was the 30s, the Great Lettuce Battle of the 30s, which happened to be the prequel to the Great Lettuce Battle of the 1970s where La Union de Cesar Chavez, the UFW, came to town and pretty much just uh, disrupted the growers' attempt to thwart farm workers from organizing and choosing their own union. Those efforts brought about a, 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 a time when, when farm workers were able to earn enough money to purchase their own home. Wow, that's mind-blowing. 
those were the 70s. But Reaganomics of the 80s put, a, put an end to that. That was an all-out attack on, on labor. And because of that, all of so many of the factories that, were, that existed in the Salinas, in Salinas area, specifically in Salinas, were outsourced to Mexico, to the Far East, leaving us jobless. In the 80s, <laughs> Salinas became synonymous with a criminalized, uh, as a criminal community. That, that, that led up to all of this attention, this whole national attention that garnered us uh, uh, the attention of the Clinton administration in the 1990s. President Bill Clinton comes and does a visit right in front of the same jail that, that incarcerated, <laughs> that locked up Chavez in the 1970s for calling a lettuce boycott. President Bill Clinton is up there with, you know, with our community and championing uh, the crime bill that ultimately criminalized a lot of uh, our community, locked up a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of folks I grew up with, destroyed families. We took a hit, and we didn't even know it, and we kept taking hits, especially around the housing, the housing crisis of 2008. Uh, the, the more reputa more attention around uh, negative uh, media attention around being being the second least educated community in the United States by Forbes magazine, Forbes mag Forbes being um, an entity, a big entity in in ag tech. But it's all because of that. It's because of that whole effort, right? That we stand here today. Citing Salinas Inclusionary Economic Development Initiative as a present day collaboration that demonstrates to you the values and visions of those who came before us. So as a member of Building Healthy Communities and Organizing Workforce, I'm proud to, proud to be a part of this, this, uh, this group of us like, who are we're carrying these values, these, these lessons from the past seven generations to inform the next seven generations. Okay, thank you, Chago. Thank you. So you can't understand CITI without understanding the role of the James Irvine Foundation and their emphasis on funding of priority communities throughout California. So at this point, I want to ask two people to speak, uh, Chang Ung from the James Irvine Foundation, and following her will be Laurel Lee Alexander from the Community Foundation for Monterey County, who is uh, passing through those James Irvine funds. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, my, my name is Chang Ung, and I'm a program officer at the James Irvine Foundation. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about Irvine, um, our priorities, and just how what our relationship is with um, the Community Foundation, um, CITI, and all the wonderful partners that are here today. Um, the Irvine Foundation is a private foundation whose North Star is a California where all low-wage workers have the power to advance economically. And we do that through a variety of different grant-making initiatives, but the one that I'm going to focus on and share about is called Priority Communities, where we focus on community efforts to help create economies that work for all residents. And we do that in five specific cities throughout California, and those five cities are Fresno, Stockton, Riverside, San Bernardino, and specifically in Salinas. And um, our goals in priority communities are really about creating more good jobs in these communities. It's about ensuring that low-wage workers in these communities then have access to these good jobs. It's a really about um, supporting community-led efforts about increasing that spread of good jobs. And it's also about leveraging our you know, um, own dollars to bring in increased you know, public, private, and philanthropic dollars into these cities and into these regions. And so what that looks like in terms of grant making has really ranged from you know, supporting inclusive economic development um, effort. It has included entrepreneurship, workforce development, capacity building of local organizations, and a variety of different efforts. Um, and in Salinas, we've been really lucky um, to be able to partner with the Community Foundation for Monterey County, CFMC, to support CITI, the Salinas Inclusive Econo Economic Development Initiative, 
which is a really multifaceted, both grant making, capacity building program that really centers, you know, um, on the role that local nonprofit organizations um, can play in inclusive economic development planning and implementation, and how they have the leadership and the voice to be able to help shape and create a more inclusive and equitable um, economy in Salinas. And they do that really right through centering racial equity, but also uplifting the voices, the experience, and the power of local leaders, community members, and low-wage workers at the center. And so, um, you know, we are incredibly thankful for the leadership of, you know, of CFMC, for all the CITE partners, and, you know, our ability to really help, you know, potentially shape the future of Salinas that, you know, um, where low-wage workers are not, you know, left out of the picture, but can lead at the table and help make Salinas a place where, you know, everyone can thrive. And so I will pass it over to Laurel. Thank you, Chang. Thank you, Chago. I'm Laurel Lee Alexander. I'm Vice President of Community Impact at the Community Foundation for Monterey County, and it's great to see you all. The vision of the Community Foundation is healthy, safe, and vibrant communities, and inclusive economic development is a strong fit with our mission. Both the Irvine Foundation and the Community Foundation have invested in Monterey County, specifically Salinas, for many years. But the Irvine Foundation has partnered with us, the Community Foundation, since 2018 for specific programs and initiatives in Salinas. We're really pleased that this third initiative is really centering racial equity and all voices at the table for inclusive economic development. The Investment in Salinas also complements other initiatives that the Community Foundation is not leading, like re Regions Rise Together. We are the intermediary, so the James Irvine Foundation is using, in a good, word, in a good way, us to help facilitate this and design CITE. And while we have designed the Salinas Inclusive Economic Development Initiative, we are not the experts by any means, and this grant is also helping the Community Foundation to increase our capacity around inclusive economic development. So we're, we're really proud of this initiative. It's great to be here together with all of the CITE partners, and uh, thank you for being here. Okay, thank you. So we, we've got so many people that want to be a part of telling this story that there's going to be a lot of movement back and forth on stage. There's going to be a new panel step up, and then there's going to be a group come and take the place behind. Uh, and hopefully you're getting an idea that, that there are a number of people who are writing this story and want to share it with you today. Um, well, let's thank you, uh, Chago, for setting the scene. Thank you, Cheng and Laurel, for talking about the role of funders. Let's talk about the community organizations who are working to make this happen. And uh, I, I wanna just frame a little bit about our story that we wanna tell you today. As we look back on year one, we are pleased with what we've accomplished. Uh, we uh, have been very intentional about needing to come together in a powerful way to go through a process of formation and to build a culture that could support our strategy. What we want to share with you is how we've gone about this project in a way that opens up the potential for transformational shifts. And there's two observations that I really want to start with that will run through our presentation. Number one, we have not overestimated the power of money and its ability to bring the cohort together in a way that will actually produce change. By that I mean we are taking into account, and you're going to hear lots of discussion today about what we have done to disrupt the usual relationships between funders and communities. We think that's essential, uh, an essential part of our story that we want to share, especially for those of you that are participating in cohorts that are um, driven by significant funding from uh, foundations. The second thing that we want to uh, uh, talk about has a little bit to do with my role as project manager and my background, which is I've been an organizer since 1978 in a variety of settings. Most recently, I spent uh, uh, before uh, something resembling retirement, um, I spent 15 years with the IAF organizing network. 
What I think is important about that is that when I took on this job as project manager, I did not know exactly what CITE would actually do in the way of action. But I was very clear on what had to happen to bring the community of cohort organizations together in a way that would allow the potential for action. So my role as an organizer and the way we've thought about coming together, uh, I think is another theme we wanna share with you as we go along. So we're gonna have some storytelling from some of the participants and uh, we're gonna start at the very beginning. The, the, one of the keys to CITE I think has been that unlike a lot of economic development initiatives, I salute uh, the James Irvine Foundation and the Community Foundation because they did not write a grant that said we're going to produce 500 jobs, we're going to raise wages by $3 per hour on average over the next two years. A lot of, a lot of these um, what I would call overcommitments in a very complicated economic development mm -hmm. arena that often leave people somewhat uh, disillusioned. Instead, the grant focused on a very simple but powerful proposition. The goal was to help these organizations, quote, increase their ability to influence inclusive economic development decisions in the region. So the theory of the grant was quite simple, that if the voices with power at the decision-making tables were different, the outcomes could perhaps be different. And if those voices were connected to each other and connected in, to powerful social movements that could apply uh, a political pressure and uh, a force to the uh, stories about a need for more inclusive economy, then that would be a way that change could happen. So we wanna start by thinking a little bit about how the cohort was selected and Steve Lieberman of Loaves, Fishes and Computers, also known as LFC, will talk a little bit about the selection of the cohort. Thank you, Ken. That's a great introduction. Yeah, my name is Steve Lieberman. I'm the board president uh, with LFC. Where we work to close the digital divide and promote digital equity by providing people, individuals, and families with the technology and the technology skills they need to fully participate in education, in the workforce, and in civic life. I was asked to talk about the selection of the cohort, and I think Ken just framed it uh, really well. This, it, we're organized for action. That's kind of what, uh, what was the motivating factor Right, so how best do you do that? Well, you, you need to bring together organizations that are deeply rooted in the community, and you need to bring together organizations that cover a, a, a diversity of, of skills and knowledge, right? So focusing on really being effective from, from the ground up, from the community leaders up to help, help us make decisions about what we're gonna do based on the, the, the knowledge from the, the people that know the community best. That's, that's the model, and I think it's extremely important that it starts from the very beginning. So really, the simple answer to the best way to make progress for action is to bring together the organizations that understand different aspects of the economic needs of the community, and have roots in different places where we can bring those skills and those backgrounds and knowledge together to be much more effective than any one of us could be on our own. Uh, and you're gonna hear a lot of other examples uh, in the next uh, half hour or so about iterating on that principle. Uh, and what, one of the ways you'll hear about that is with the baseline assessment where, where Ken and, and Irvine Foundation and CFMCO asked us, what is our current capability and where do we go from here, right? We weren't told, right, create 500 jobs. It was, you know the community best, you're the leaders, tell us what's going on and help us get to where you need to go. Thank you, thank you for joining us today 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, did everybody get a handout when you walked in? If not, they're on the table back there. And there is a, uh, two things I'll point out. There's a list of the nine cohort organizations, and there's also a very short link to what the CITE story map, which will give you in-depth understanding about each of those organizations. These organizations, as Steve said, were not selected for previous expertise on economic development. On the contrary, many of them have had no experience in economic development, but what they are experienced in, as Steve said, is the rootedness and connectedness to the community. So uh, the handout will help you flesh that out. So as project manager, I had to find a way to engage in conversation with the cohort about what society could be, how we were gonna go about our business. And you know, words are sometimes very hard uh, uh, things to form and capture something as complicated. And um, I began to talk with people about an image that I think seemed to click with people and that I think still clicks. And I wanna shift the story now to talk a little bit about how the, the society a society principle is to let organizations find their own way into the initiative in a way that works for them. What, what I came up with was the idea of a, uh, each organization needing to find a way to create its own orbit around the goal. So in other words, the goal was to increase their ability to influence inclusive economic development. That was the sun. Each of the nine organizations, the planets, had to come up and find their orbit around that goal. What, how were they going to interpret that? What was going to be their activity? And the collective idea there was something which would begin to emerge as a society solar system. So a very key value was to help them find their orbit around the goal and the expression of that. We're going to hear a couple stories from uh, Chris Devers of Rancho Cielo and Maria Elena Manso of Mujeres en Acción that speak to their experience of finding their way into society. Chris. Okay, buenos tardes a todos y bienvenidos. Uh, my name is Chris Devers. I'm the, uh, the new CEO of Rancho Cielo. I've been in the role about nine months. Uh, previous to that, I was Senior Director of Alternative Education uh, with the Monterey County Office of Ed. Um, that sets the stage for how we got into society, um, which is why I begin with that. Um, I would just say that Rancho Cielo, uh, I very much view it as an economic uh, de development organization uh, focused on education and training uh, for 16 to 25 year olds uh, who seek to earn their high school diploma and want to go into one of the trade programs uh, that we offer. Um, when I first got into the role, I received a phone call uh, from Ken requesting a, a meeting uh, Ken joined us in my office, and we sat down. Uh, for me, as everything was, you know, coming full speed ahead, and uh, you know, with, with force and very complex. And we talked about side A, and first it was it was for me to understand what side A was and and what it is ultimately that that we were to do. Um, but one of the things that I appreciated the most was um, really uh, Ken's um, introduction of side A to me and to our team which has become a team totally focused around this initiative, and allowing us to look at how uh, Saide would fit into Rancho Cielo's mission and what it, what it is that we do as an organization so that it wouldn't become an additional thing uh, that we were tasked with doing, uh, that it, but that it would become a meaningful piece that sets the trajectory uh, for what our organization does in the community that we work with. Uh, we are situated in Salinas. The majority of our clients come from Salinas, specifically East Salinas. Um, and so it was important to us uh, to look at, obviously, um, how effective we are at doing that work and how we would roll that out. And uh, the thing that I appreciated the very most about this initiative was um, looking at uh, developing an action plan and really articulating how this was going to fit with what we were doing to better do uh, what it is that we were already down the path of doing, um, but offering uh, new and improved things. Um, and, and the example of where that all led to is uh, we developed a case management model led by our lead case manager, Gabriela Manza, in the audience. And that uh, we were able to bring her on board and develop that model, um, really all coming out of this from the intake process. So 
appreciative for the opportunity to our partners at the Community Foundation, James Irvine Foundation for funding this and uh, Ken's uh, job for, for really organizing us all and bringing us and me in particular as a new CEO into the fold um, to make this uh, what it is today for us. So thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, if you're ever in in Salinas on a Friday, and I understand they have a good uh, uh, a cooking program where they teach students how to cook and they serve a good meal, so more, more advertisement on that later. Uh, Maria Elena. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Elena Manso. I'm the program director for Mujeres en Acción. Mujeres en Acción is a program uh, based on, on the, or, or the focus is to help women become economically self-sufficient and also develop their leadership to engage effectively in public life and changing the, the things that are affecting their, their families. Um, we are in Monterey County and part of Santa Cruz County. The way I see society funding being truly inclusive is because they're not requiring us to drop everything that we're doing and start doing something different, but rather they're supporting the work that we, the good work that we already are doing. I wanna think that's the reason why Mujeres en Acción was chosen. Uh, most community organizations are, we all get funding, we have less funding than what we need to do the work that we are set to do, but we do it because we're passionate about it. So when, when new funding comes in, Sometimes you have to drop what you're doing and, and stretch yourself even further to comply with the requirements of, of that funding. Society was different completely of what we're used to. It was a different approach. And I heard this uh, morning saying, uh, somebody coming and saying, what do you need? That's the, the approach that they're saying. They, they came and asked us how, how the funding they, that they're giving us could increase our capacity to continue doing the great work that we were doing. Um, and also uh, giving us the support that we needed to build the capacity. Through mentorship and, and technical assistance, we were able to learn what the, in, in our case, we were able to learn what the programs, in uh, the women in our own program really understood about Mujeres en Acción. We had uh, the, base, uh, the baseline assignment that uh, somebody mentioned already, uh, and we realized that the message was not being clear to the women. Um, and uh, up until now, what Mujeres does is by instincts. We have the instincts which are good, but that's not enough. You have to have a structure that could be followed in the future for new leadership. So. We want the new leadership to be able to understand the vision and the mission that we have in order to continue the work. Uh, we also have access to a grant that is going to help us transfer what it's in our minds <laughs> into stories and, and messaging that will help us make it clear enough for funders to, to feel interested in investing in us. And uh, we are also, working to develop our data, uh, database, the, because it's hard to keep all the, the success stories in our head. Every time we have to, to uh, apply for funding, we have, who, who was that? Yeah, there, there were so many, yeah. And, and so, so we need to make sure that we have a, a database that is gonna help us in the, in the future. If we're not able to tell our, our real story clearly, we cannot attract the funders that could be really interested in supporting the work that we do. And this technical assistant the grant is helping mujeres to create the message, the clear message that can lead us into economic uh, sustainability. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So while the cohort was finding their orbit and once they found it and developed their plans uh, to help them stay in orbit instead of flying off into space, uh, Excuse me, I love the analogy and I, I play with it all the time. Uh, we, we, we have some other uh, uh, partners that we work with. Built into our initiative is an important provision of a very involved mentor program. There are seven mentors that, we, uh, that are supported by the grant funds and they have a very close working relationship with the cohort. Uh, and I'm going to ask Kaki Russmore, one of our mentors, to describe that relationship. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Glad you could be here this afternoon. 
Um, as Ken said, we have seven mentors in our program, all of whom are people with extensive experience in nonprofit organizational development and deep ties to working with organizations taking, um, making community change happen. So I'm one of those. And um, the mentors work directly with the organizations taking our lead from the organizations to support them to fulfill the goals that they have for themselves. So we work with them as, to use, to use the orbit uh, analogy again, to help them define what that orbit is gonna be, how they define inclusive economic development and how they wanna interact with that and how they want to work with the other organizations in the cohort. Um, the whole point of this is, as you've heard already, but it's to build the muscle to more profoundly influence economic decision making in Salinas. So mentors are not consultants who come in with an answer or tell an organization what to do. Um, rather, we work to build a trusting relationship with the organizations and act as thought partner, listener, question asker. We bring our, our experience and our skills, and amongst us we have a very broad range of skills, and we depend on each other to you know, fill in the gaps of something we don't know. Um, and we first off recognize that all the organizations we work with are very successful at what they do, and they are very grounded in the community. So what we try to do is we offer experience, we help connect the organizations to resources, we assist them in thinking through what it is that they will need to do differently to have the transformational impact on economic development that will lead to the equity that is so important to all of them. As mentors, we work with the organizations to identify skills, approaches, and tools where they'll make them stronger, more effective, and more sustainable while weaving what, we are, are, what they're already doing with the CITE goals, as, as both our previous speakers spoke to so eloquently. We also help the stage for the cohort members to meet each other, to get to know each other better, and to begin to lower silos and work together for collective action. I've had the opportunity to design several cohort-based organizational capacity programs. I was in on the early stage of designing CITE, and um, one thing that's different about CITE from some of the other programs I've worked with is the shared commitment to inclusive economic development, where each organization is des defining that in their own way, but then also working together to figure out what that shared definition is. I think that's, I think that's it. I think I'm stopping. Okay, there. well, if that's it, you can stop. <laughs> nice, Khaki, thank you, thank you. Well, so it's time now for them to step down and our next crew to come in. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about something that, that I think is, 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 is very interesting and, and powerful and profound to grapple with, which is I want you to imagine being one of these nine community organizations and you open up your mail one day and it's a letter from the Community Foundation for Monterey County, and it says, you have been selected to be one of nine organizations to be part of an inclusive economic development initiative. It comes with $100,000 of funding, general operating support for two years. Congratulations. So you get that letter, I want you to imagine what you think about when you get that letter. What, what I wanna to begin to talk about is the importance of establishing the right kind of relationship between the organizations and the initiative. Because when, when, when they got that letter, the, when I talked to some of them, the first question was, well, what's expected of us? What do we have to do? What are our responsibilities? What are our obligations? Well, the first reaction was, hey, we got $100,000. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? But what, what's expected of us, what's required of us, uh, and, and from the foundations, uh, the community foundation's point of view, they had to begin to articulate. So that was the start of the relationship. 
I want to suggest that built into our relationship has been the commitment to disrupt the usual relationship between funders and fundees. And let me talk a little bit about why we've done that, and then I'll ask for some stories. I think we all have to admit that there is learned behavior on both sides, between funders and between fundees. And the question we've asked, we have to ask ourselves, is that learned behavior, does that, has that resulted in the kind of behavior that will allow for powerful social movement building and transformational shifts? Our, our assessment in, in talking about it uh, with the initial community foundation people and myself and, and increasingly with the cohort was, no, it's not. Too often, uh, uh, fundees enter into an arena and they think they're in competition with other groups for scarce funding. So we wanted to send a signal that that's not the case. There's abundant funding. There's plenty of funding. Um, too often, uh, uh, cohort initiatives might not break through to innovation and creation because people are risk averse because if they try and do something and it fails, they'll look bad for the funder. And we wanted to free people up and encourage them to take risks. Most importantly, uh, we wanted to break through to a model where fundees didn't expect that they were gonna be asked to do things as leverage for funding, but that we worked on shared values and a shared commitment to planning, strategy, and activities so that what became important to me as a project director was that we had their consent. That what motivated the work of CITE was their consent. It was work they wanted to be doing, not the work that they thought I wanted them to be doing. So those are a few of the things that we did. Oh, one more that I think is very important. Um, sometimes I think funders don't ask enough of organizations that they are giving this kind of money to. And the reason they don't ask enough is because they're not prepared to give enough. And I made it clear to the cohort right away, we're gonna ask you for a lot, but we're also gonna invest in you. We're gonna help you grow and develop. We're gonna provide you resources. And so I think uh, we, we, we've, we've tried to calibrate a relationship where they, we expect a lot from them and they expect a lot from us. And that's what makes it work. So I wanna hear some stories now from Gabriela Chavez of uh, Lowe's Fishes and Computers, Adriana Malgosa of uh, Center for Community Advocacy, about how we've tried to get the right relationship and how they've experienced that. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Lopez Chavez with LFC. Um, and you've heard uh, from many members of the panel how this was a really truly an intention to have an equitable partnership. Um, and we've really seen that. Um, for us, um, it has been truly a, um, a partnership that would render the best and most appropriate relationship, and that's um, something that we've seen. It's been inclusive right from the start, and between Ken, uh, members of the Community Foundation, our advisory committee, the mentors, and other members of the cohort, we've developed the initiative and what we wanted to accomplish, um, and we've done so in partnership. Um, it has felt very genuine in this partnership, and we felt that we've had a voice. Um, one of the examples that uh, resonated with us was um, there was a conversation of some statewide and regional-wide um, economic development initiatives, um, including SURF. And the, this was brought up in one of our meetings. And during that meeting, um, there was a lot of voices that wanted to talk about how, how we could get involved. Um, for, for LFC, being a smaller organization, this was really important because without um, without CITE, we may not have a voice to be able to speak on this or learn or provide some feedback. So that was really important for us. Um, and what we noticed was that CITE and the members were able to adjust, not just discussing about this, but actually taking action from it and, and building from it. Um, further for us, um, it opened opportunities with cohort members um, and committee members that we wouldn't have had otherwise. For us, it's, um, for LFC, it's provided um, the opportunity to be more intentional in our advocacy and our policy efforts that we haven't had in the past. Um, being an organization focused on digital equity, this has been really important because digital inclusion and access to digital devices and tools and connection is an economic and social justice issue, and CITE has allowed us uh, to have a platform to do that. Okay, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Adriana? So, yes, yeah, so 
I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the experience where a collaborate, I've been in many collaborates, and you know when you apply for a job, they say five or more years of experience. Um, but then you're like, how do I get the experience if no one is giving me the opportunity for uh, obtaining that experience? This collaborate is different in that way. Um, this collaborate brought us together with, yes, our own expertise, but it also is providing a space where we're co-learning from each other and co-learning from other um, mentors, from other uh, individuals who are bringing uh, materials and tools to continue to uplift the work that we do together. It's not a space where we're performing uh, and where we are expected to know everything and expected to uh, show uh, results right away. It's a space where we are allowed to think and allowed to, the same way that we co, uh, share co-knowledge, we also share co-learning uh, spaces. And so uh, this collaborative and society has provided that space for all of us to be able to uh, think clearly and say, this is the expertise that I have, this is the program that I have, how can I even uplift it even more and do more with what I am currently having as an organization, but also how is this tied to other organizations and how do we tie uh, all of our programs together to uplift an area, to uplift a community because at the end of the day we're working for that, right? All of our organizations are working to bring some equitable spaces in our communities and that's what this space has brought us, uh, uh, at least for Center for Community Advocacy and for, I hope, for the rest of the cohort. Thank you, Adriana. So. Part of getting the right relationship was uh, making sure that as leaders of the initiative on the grant side and as project manager, we gave the cohort the time that they needed and the activities in that time so that they could rise to the immense challenge of making a transformational shift in an economy that currently doesn't serve working families. Let's be clear, this is not a two-year initiative. This is a 25-year project to try and deal with the historical realities that Chago gave you some insight into. So a big part of our approach was to say to them in January of 2022, you do not need to have a plan in place for how you will expend funds and what you will do until July 1st, 2022. We want to give you six months to do three things. We want you to meet the subject of our economy and how we think about our economy and how our economy is designed. We want you to meet your fellow cohort participants, not perfunctorily, but in a deep and powerful way that builds trust and collaboration. And number three, we want you to meet yourself as an organization and really critically look at your capacity right now and grapple with what you need to do. So um, I, wanna, uh, I wanna ask some of the organizations to talk a little bit about that time for formation that was critical to, I think, to where they're positioned now. We'll start with Natalie Herendine of Center for Community Advocacy. Uh, thank you. So yeah, so CITI is different than any other grant, and I'm a new ED at the Center for Community Advocacy, and, and grants in general were new to me. It wasn't something I had done prior to this position. And unlike some of the other grants that we got where uh, you, know, you fill out an application on what you're gonna do and then you execute basically, this grant, they, they invited us, CITI invited us to partake in the year, and it, it was really surprising too because it was like, well, here's this money, and you guys get to plan what you wanna do with it, but we also kind of walked into it not exactly knowing what was going to happen or how it was going to be. But Saidi has uh, taken the opportunity and the time to uh, teach us, uh, provide us resources, time, people, and money. We all received a mentor that is working with us and helping us formulate our plans. And it gave us an opportunity to look at how we could really make workforce development intentional within our organizations. And I think for most of us, we already had that there but it was to have an opportunity and time and some education too on how we could develop it more and create a plan and a program to better our community. And uh, CIDI has served as a vehicle to connect us all 
and form deeper relationships or form new relationships and hopefully that will lead to deeper relationships but also connect with power players in the community that can help us facilitate our plans and take them to the next level um, so yes yeah, thank you okay thanks natalie uh, one of our uh, cohort organizational partners is the monterey bay central labor council and cesar lara is going to say a few words good afternoon everybody uh, cesar lara i'm the executive director of the monterey bay um, Central Labor Council, and unlike Natalie, I'm an old card. I've been around for a while, but I'm, I'm the director of the local labor council, and we cover Monterey and Santa Cruz County with 37,000 union members, uh, 80 different unions, but 10,000 of those are in Salinas. And so, you know, Salinas is a very, very special place for us, and we have the history of activism uh, in the Salinas Valley and in the Tri County area. This is, you know, like Chago said, this is a territory where the Esalen uh, Nation and, and other tribes, you know, there's three missions. When Filipino workers rose up, they were chased out of town, literally burned out. Um, when Cesar Chavez uh, came around, the only time Cesar Chavez was arrested was in Monterey County. And so this is a significant and important part of, of our community and we also learned a lot during the COVID period. Our community is where kids were found outside of Taco Bell trying to find internet access to get to school. Uh, this is the community that one time, uh, the New York Times said, there's more uh, housing density in East Salinas than the island of Manhattan. Uh, this is at one time the youth murder capital of California. And so we have a lot of challenges that we have to deal with and so much of it is around race and class. And you know the community has told us, uh, had you know has told us what needs to happen, and and we've had a number of uh, initiatives in our community, like the Regions Rising Together, Impact Monterey County, things like you know ten years of the Building Health Initiative, but there is a difference between CIDI and just another an, uh, another initiative, and you know trying to learn from others and make a difference. But you know the biggest thing is that the community has told us what they want. If I go into a community meeting with a blank piece of paper and tell them what's the problems in, in the city, residents are gonna take their shoes off and throw them at me. Because they've already been told us really clear what, what, what needs to happen. And so we're rich in initiatives, but we also need to get ready to action. And I think that's the difference and that's the opportunity that we have with this initiative. That you know we, we need to move to action, but let's hurry up and wait and make sure that the community is ready to be part of that. Because those that have been victims of systems should be in the forefront of changing those, those systems. And that's what this, this has allowed us to do. And we need to be equitable in the way that we approach economic development. Uh, CITI has allowed different organizations to come together with different skill sets as activists, but also understand that you need different skill sets to be in the world of economic development. Uh, CITI has allowed groups from vast and different backgrounds to have our incubator time. You know, this first year was get to know each other from very different backgrounds. You know, I'll be honest, I asked Ken and others, like, how did this group get into this, you know, and it took me a while to kind of figure it out. And, you know, and Ken clearly told me, he's like, just, just wait, see how it goes. <laughs> and, 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 I've, and I've seen the potential in it, and CITI has really allowed us to really come together and show that economic development of the past has not worked. And we, um, and we can't just carry forward the old economy. And we need a new, a, a new way, a new, a new beginning uh, to ensure that working families are centered and prioritized. Uh, we need time to lead. You know, CITI has stressed the importance of preparing to lead and, and and asked us and others to take the time to really make sure that we are successful. You know, the building trades, we have this notion of measure twice and cut once. And I think that's what CITI has allowed us to do. And to ensure that we're, we're not just another initiative. And like Chago said, think of the seven generations before us, but also think of the seven generations ahead of us. And history and time with support from CITI um, we, we have this golden time because, you know, we've had these lessons. We have this time and place in history and, you know, no pressure. But, um, you know, we're, you know, uh, if, if not us, who? So. Okay, thank you, Caesar. Thank you. Yeah. 
Appreciate that. Um, so I uh, want to focus on two things that have uh, two things that that are examples of asking the cohort to hurry up and 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 uh, wait. As Cesar said, by that we mean yes, there's an urgent need for action, but are you prepared to take action? The first thing we asked them to do was what was called a baseline assessment. And once again, on your handout, you have a link to uh, information about the, the nine success factors that we developed and the way the organizations uh, scored themselves on that. Uh, they did 141 assessments throughout the nine organizations. Basically, that was, in my, the way I describe it, those organizations looked at themselves in the mirror and said, are we ready to do this? And I want to hear a little bit from Gabriella and Steve about how that process benefited LFC through the baseline assessment. Great. Um, if I can ask uh, Steve to join me. Or, sorry. Um, sure. Come on up, Steve. While he joins us, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how it worked for LFC. So um, we asked our staff and our volunteers and our, and our board um, to answer these questions. It was really reflective of our, it was an opportunity to look at ourselves in the mirror. and. We found out that collectively, um, our organization really wanted to look at advocacy and messaging as an important part. Um, and what it did was it informed what we were going to do with those funds, with our CITE um, grant moving forward. Um, and we were really going to be looking at policy change and advocacy as an important part. The other piece was we were going to what we call uh, walk the talk, meaning that we were looking internally about how we were uh, involved in inclusive economic development as an organization, as an employer. And so that is part of it. And what the baseline assessment and the um, resulting action plan has done is it's created uh, some pieces for us to look at how we move forward. Prior to this, we thought it would be done parallel with our strategic plan. And in actual actuality, sorry, um, it's actually um, informed our strategic plan. So it's actually been a big piece of how we're looking at our organization within three years, and that's been really important and transformative for LFC. Uh, that's, that's right. I really just wanted to recognize Joy Ruby as our mentor for working so closely with us uh, in, at such a deep level to develop our strategy and strategic plan for LFC with the action plan for CITI. From the very beginning, we, we used this baseline and we iterated on it many, many times and it became, like Gabby said, a very, very deep part of what LFC is doing for the next several years. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. I, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank the society cohort organizations for their willingness to look critically at themselves. That is not an easy thing for community organizations to do, uh, especially if they are community organizations such as Center for Community Advocacy, Building Healthy Communities, the Labor Council, some of the more sophisticated, established organizations in our cohort. All, all of us, we come along and we say, you need to do things differently, perhaps. I applaud them for being willing to take a look at that because that's not always something organizations want to do. That's been a key, a key part of this. Um, the last thing uh, about uh, taking our time has been the importance of the gathering of the CITE cohort, and I'm going to ask Elizabeth Jimenez of Rancho Cielo to talk a little bit about those convenings. Thank you, Chris. Well, the CITE convenings, can be described as a syn synergy between nine diverse organizations that came together once a month with one common interest, how to develop a more equitable and inclusive economy in the Salinas Valley. The cohort members contributed ideas throughout the year, allowing for an open space of discussion, debate, and strategizing around the economic opportunities available for everyone in our community. Gathering nine nonprofits to pursue one goal made it clear to everyone that we were there to make a difference. Having our mentors and the advisory council present in each meeting strengthened our relationship and we became allies in a common cause. 
Most importantly, to talk about equity and inclusivity, we had to set an example and create a welcoming environment where everyone's voice mattered, which is not only it's not always easy to accomplish when a language and a cultural differences exist in our society. Having translators and interpreters present throughout the full day means there's the will to comprehend the needs of those we serve by eliminating barriers and creating a common ground. After six convenings, the first being online and the following in person, we now have bonded, recognizing the crucial role we each play in the economic development of our region. As a whole, we will significantly impact our economy by advocating for those who need it the most. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So remember I said we, we made a deal with each other, we expected a lot and we give a lot. So um, one of the learnings I have from this is um, when we decided to, host, to hold convenings that were six or seven hours long and ask these busy folks to, to give us a day, give Saidi a day, um, I wasn't sure that that was gonna work. But what, it, what, what we found out is that if we were scared enough uh, about having to ask them to do that, that we did a good job of planning events that were interesting and exciting for them, and if they were willing to suspend disbelief and say, okay, I guess I'll go and clear my schedule, that we could make it work. And so I think we've broken through to a place, hopefully now, where we, we appreciate the convenings for the power that they've offered, as Elizabeth said. So uh, let's get our next panel up here. Thank you to this crew. And the next one is fun because we're gonna talk about uh, meeting the subject of our economy and solidarity economics and uh, Chris Benner is going to uh, start that off, and then some respondents on the panel will, will respond to him. Um, can I just see a show of hands? Is there anyone in the audience who would identify themselves as primarily based in an academic organization, university? One, two, three, four, okay, five, awesome. Well, one of the signs that you know that this is a community-driven and community-owned process is that I had um, 40 slides I was gonna show you, the statistics of inequality and Monterey and all that, and we kinda all decided that wasn't really appropriate. But that's what academics do, right? Um, now, uh, what I wanted to share a little bit is, I mean, one, it's just an honor to be part of um, this initiative, and I got pulled in, in part because uh, I had written a book um, with Manuel Pastor. Um, some of you may know this is our fifth book together. Um, we've been doing work for the last 20, 30 years, really trying to document the ways that social equity is good for economic growth. And part of what happened in the midst of the pandemic is really making obvious with all the intersecting crises that we talked in our opening session about of the racial inequality and income inequality um, that's so exacerbated by the pandemic, global climate change, the climate, uh, the crisis of democracy and all, is that we really needed to figure out how to portray that academic evidence that's driven you know, by our work, many other people's work, including very conservative institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, demonstrating that equity is actually good for our economy. But it needed to be in a vision, right? It needed to be you know, a, a, an exciting, hopefully, um, vision for our future and going forward. And so you know, building on 20 years of engagement with social movement organizations, community organizations, um, we wrote a long book, and if I was a good salesperson, I'd have a copy of it here, and I'd show you how to buy it. You can go to our, our website, solidarityeconomics.org, to actually download it. But you know, after you write a whole book, it's kind of um, I don't know, humiliating is maybe the word, or humbling anyway, um, to realize that we could have said it in, in three sentences, really. <laughs> yeah. um, the first sentence is, it's not the economy, it's our economy economy. And I don't know if you've noticed, but everyone up here who's mentioned economy has said our economy. I've noticed it. It's really awesome. And part of why that's important is when you say the economy, it suggests that it's something in nature. There are natural laws out there. We just have to adapt ourselves to it. 
And our role for those of us who are concerned about social equity and economic opportunity is to figure out, oh, how do you plug in to the right spot and get the right skills to connect to the economy that others have created? But our economy is created by decisions about where resources are allocated, by laws and regulations, and by resource allocation that determines who has access and who doesn't. So we need to start by understanding our economy. And the second thing is that mutuality matters. Our economy is not driven by individual actors responding to price signals. We are all part of communities. We're part of families. We're connected. And our economy only functions because of those interrelationships and connections. And it turns out when you invest in that mutuality, we get better economic outcomes. So the third point is that because some people benefit from our current economic structures, we need movements. And we need movements to shift those power relationships so that we can readjust the order of our economy and how the decisions are made. But movements also help us see our connections, understand our inner relationships, and how interdependent we are. In the same way that markets make selfish, individualized people, movements make mutual, connected people and communities. So with that framework, we were invited to be partners with the Society Initiative and help try and see, well, how could that framework help link to the realities of this incredible work these nine organizations are doing and others in, in Salinas. And so, you know, we worked to do some of the analysis and I could show you the 40 slides about the levels of inequality and how it's driven so much along racial lines as well as place-based lines. And one of the more striking things to me looking at it is realizing the um, apartheid-like government structures we have in our region here, as in many regions of the United States, where our local governments are fragmented with separate tax bases and separate resources, but our economy is interconnected. And people are migrating back and forth on daily commutes, long distances sometimes in heavy traffic. And, and the statistic I would leave you with is the city of Monterey has five times the tax base per capita of the city of Salinas. But 85% of the workforce of Monterey, driven by the tourism industry, the accommodation That's industry, where. does not live in Monterey. Has no right to vote in Monterey. They can't afford to live there. And yet, our economy that they're helping to generate is creating the sales tax revenue, the hotel tax revenue that's providing those tremendous tax resources for those residents of Monterey. So solidarity economics helps us see the ways that inequality undermines our economic prosperity. But it also helps us see how movements and mutuality show our future. And there are tremendous examples of community health worker initiatives, the VITA program, efforts to come together in the election this next week, no, two weeks, November 8th, um, to help raise additional funds for early childhood education, because as was said so powerfully in the open plenary this morning, that we know our communities are doing well and our children are doing well. Um, and so our hope in the work with the Society Initiative is to help see that mutual future and help realize it. So we're doing that in a number of different ways, and this is early days, but one of the first things was um, getting students connected to the society organizations to help lift up their voices and their stories. And one of the things you'll see in the handout is story.society.org is a story map of students coming together and helping to lift up the work of these nine organizations. But the other place we started is not with analysis of the industries and the jobs and the wages, as important that is. We started with a power map of the decision-making ecosystem in the Salinas economy, in our economy. And it's a way of really trying to visualize, and it's an interactive tool that we've been using as a capacity building, training, and collective knowledge generation process for all of us to better understand who has influence of decision-makers 
in official decision-making capacities, in industry leadership positions um, across our economy, and how aligned are they with an inclusive economy agenda and, or the status quo. And from that, then we will begin to figure out how our research can go more in depth into issues that can help support the organizing. And the final thing I'll say is, you know, we're trying to help this solidarity economics framework be, be not just an academic book, but be something that gets out in a popular context and understanding through social media, through videos, and through a comic book um, that is coming out. There are some sample chapters on the table. Please grab them on your way out. We'll have a few version out, full version out in two weeks that'll be both in Spanish and English with all chapters in it. Um, so that's part of what we're, trying, what we're trying to do. It's just an honor to be part of this initiative. Thank you, Chris. Now, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. So I've asked four people uh, to just briefly talk about why they think solidarity economics is important as a framework for the work of society. We're going to start with Raul Lacero of CBDIO. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, Yovando Virginia Kuni. That don't need to be in your chicken, can you, you be chicken? Yeah, but she chiba. My name is Raul Lazaro. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that uh, this is now uh, our land that we guess is here. Continue to this, uh, I work for a non profit organization, uh, Centro Nacional para el Desarrollo Indígena Oaxaqueño. As we talk about great things about field workers, farm workers, uh, most of the time, if not all, are undervalued. And as we continue with climate change, um, it's important to go, uh, recognize indigenous knowledge and going back to regenerative agriculture, which is the traditional way that it has been done. And solidarity economy for us is to kind of work together uh, that include indigenous people through language justice and literacy opportunity. While we continue to empower, empower our community, we want to continue work to share our knowledge in how to, in how to cultivate an inclusive, an inclusive economy that works for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Raul. Solidarity economics gives us a framework to make sure that people who are often undervalued and overlooked are at the center. And Raul, thank you for expressing that very much. Maria Elena. Well, uh, I, what we need to do is we need to change the narrative from charity or helping the poor to we are all in this together. And the success of others around me is my own success. So it is in our own interest that everybody has access to inclusive economy because that makes a better community for me and my family to live in. If there are opportunities for the ones that have been neglected in the past, there will be more opportunities for everyone else. And if we can be economically self-sufficient, there will be more funding to create new programs to develop the new workforce that is constantly coming up. We need to be in solidarity, not only because we have a good heart or because it benefits all of us, I mean, but because it benefits all of us. Mujeres en Acción believes that if with sufficient access to knowledge, resources, and connections, women are capable of transforming their own lives, the lives of their families, and their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Elena. Natalie? Uh, yeah, so uh, Solidary Economics and Chris gives us historical context as well because the book goes back to the beginning of our nation and the fact that we're deeply rooted in oppression and that's how our system works. And so it gives us this context so we don't continue to make the same mistakes. And it's also Chris and his team in the book is helping us create credibility and data for the people that don't believe this and are fighting against change so that um, when we're faced with opposition, we have that data and that context to back us up. Okay, thank you, Natalie. 
Cesar, why don't you briefly nail this last part down? Yeah, just, you know, solidarity economics. And, and I was going to say that while what COVID showed, is not, we knew what was there. We just, you know, had a little sh uh, light shined on it. And the economy in the past has not worked for working families, has not worked for our impacted communities. And so, you know, Chris uh, and his 40 slides would have shown <laughs> that, 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 you know, we, we need solidarity, not just with working families and with organizations, with everybody, but with the whole economy. Because if we can't uplift the community, we can, uh, you know, we can't move, move forward. Okay, thank you for this panel, and our last panel will come up, and while they're coming up, uh, I'll say we're, we're trying to get this done, and we should have a, a, a little bit of time for questions. So, we are just ending our first year, and as I said, we've spent a lot of time thinking about forming ourselves capable of acting. Uh, there, there are already some early signs that the work of CITE is paying off, and that people have been engaged in activity as economic development actors and important economic development players. And we want to have uh, Maria Elena Manso, Maria Rodriguez, and Barbara Meister talk about one specific example of that, and then we'll take some questions. Okay, so uh, when my mentor Barbara suggested that we meet with Joby and, and Dart, uh, I feel kind of intimidated. I go way back with, uh, with Ken on, on working to, with an IAF organization, so I'm used to talking to county supervisors and other uh, you know, uh, elected officials, but this fell out of my league, so <laughs> out of my comfort zone. So, but with coaching uh, and preparing with Barbara, we were able to go into the meeting with the mentality that we got what you need. You know, we're here to help you out. Uh, so uh, we, we have the solution to, to your problem. We met with Josh Metz, the, the executive director and co-founder of the Monterey Bay Art uh, Initiative, and Peter Church, the aviation education manager uh, for Joby. So as soon as we started the meeting, uh, they told us of how impressed they were that with the amount of application that they received for the apprenticeship that uh, Irvine had uh, funded to, to do um, with Joby, they received a huge amount of applications from people that were connected to Mujeres. And so we told them what Mujeres was, and, and now so Maria shared her story. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es María Rodríguez y la historia que yo compartí con Jovi uh, fue cuando empecé con Mujeres en Acción. ¿Me ayudas a traducir? Yeah. So, the, the, the story that I share with Jovi is when I started with Mujeres en Acción. Yo al inicio de Mujeres en Acción, yo era ama de casa y mi familia era de bajos ingresos. Mujeres en Acción me dio la confianza y el apoyo para uh, trabajar en mis metas. Uh, before that, I used to be a, a stay-at-home mom, and uh, my family was low income. And Mujeres en Acción gave me the, the confidence and the support to work on my goals. Y en ese tiempo, con el apoyo, pude lograr mi, mi diploma de high school, inscribirme en el colegio y también a, a pasar mi examen de la ciudadanía. With that support, I was able to get my GED, uh, get my citizenship, and, and get enrolled in college. Las oportunidades y, y con la actitud, mis ganas de salir adelante. Um, hoy en día soy supervisora de cinco programas en Mujeres en Acción y económicamente autosuficiente. With the opportunities and my attitude to get ahead, today I'm economically self-sufficient. I'm a supervisor for five programs in Mujeres en Acción. Y también gracias a este trabajo, esta oportunidad, también pude comprar mi primera casa en Salinas. <laughs> yeah. I'm economically self-sufficient and I was able to buy my first home in Salinas. So. Gracias. So they were very impressed, of course, with Maria's uh, accomplishments. And, and, but and Maria is, a, is an example of what Joby wants. They were one talented, motivated woman and mothers of, of future Joby workers. So at the meeting, we learned that there are hundreds of job opportunities every year that the community doesn't know about. And that confirmed uh, 
we are really the solution. So when we were in the meeting, it's like, yeah, it's not just my attitude, but yes, we are the solution. And, and the possibility of a real partnership. You know? This is a clear, to me, this is a clear example of solidarity and mutuality. We are in this together. The success of jo Joby and Dart is linked to the success of the community. I saw, uh, just a short anecdote, I saw uh, Josh at the coffee table a couple of weeks ago at the MBEP State of the Region event, and, and he said, hey, Marielena, you need to be one of my panelists uh, for symposium next year. Uh, I mean, next month, sorry. Uh, so that tells me that he sees Mujeres as real partners, so we're in the game. <laughs> All right, excellent. So I can't think of a better way to end a, a presentation that mainly focused on how we went about building ourselves in the first year so that we would have the potential for action with a little glimpse of what lies ahead. Because this story tells us that there is a role for these community organizations to interpret the Salinas labor market to employers like Joby Aviation, to be responsible for the business climate that they perceive for their investments, rather than just accepting their version of the business climate, but to be real actors. And that we're going to leave it right there and thank all the storytellers for their participation. And we've got about 10 minutes. If any of you have any reactions or questions for the panelists or, or me, uh, we would really benefit from hearing what you think. Uh, so if anybody has any reactions or questions, yes. Hi, thank you all. This was a really interesting panel. And the description, I don't think, did it justice. We didn't realize how many speakers, so appreciate <laughs> all of the storytelling that was told. Um, my name is Molly. I work with the Moving Forward Network, and we work across the country with frontline organizations. But I was really interested when you were talking about the work that people had to do and organizations had to do internally. Mm. And if you can share a little bit more about that, because I think that that's also something that takes specific resources. And so it takes time, it takes capacity. And when we do a lot of internal work, that means we can't do our external in the same way, right? We don't have, we, there's only so many hours in the day, there's only so much work we can do. And so I guess I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about what that was like and what those experiences were like to really do that work internally. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly frame it as this. I think in, in the world that I've perceived, uh, the funder world, the project world, there tends to be a division between capacity building initiatives and action initiatives, and what we tried to do was merge them. And we said, you can't take action until you assess your capacity and build it. So that's my contribution to that. And please do look at the baseline assessment. There's a lot of information there you can look at. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with me. Any, any, anybody else want to talk about your experience of looking critically at yourself internally? If Caesar doesn't tell the story that I hope he's going to tell, I'm going to tell it. So go, Caesar. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, the biggest thing there is that I think we could chew gum and walk at the same time. And, you know, I, I, I come from an organization that, you know, it's the National AFL-CIO, blah, blah, blah. We've been around forever and, and a day. And I think that one of the things that we need to learn is that we can't continue doing the same thing we've been doing over and over again. COVID showed us everything else showed us and we need to be vulnerable as an organization internally and externally. We have our faults, you know, labor movement has issues around race and class that some of our unions need to get over, some of our unions are better advanced than others. But I think what, you know, society and everything has taught us is that we need to be in better community with each other and that some organizations that might be an arts organization might bring something to the table that would help labor and the other way around. And Thank you, story? Caesar. Any, any other, any, yeah, Joy? Joy is one of our mentors. Thank you. Um, I would like to address this question from the mentor's st uh, standpoint. Um, we identified these nine success factors mutually um, and then developed some questions to ask for each success factor and then created a uh, Google form 
um, uh, survey that each member organization could administer to the people that they thought would be the most um, appropriate to respond to those uh, to those questions to get a good picture. Some groups uh, focused on board, some focused on board and staff, some brought in volunteers, some brought in community members, and then once that information was collected, we worked with the local university statistics program students to uh, to crunch the data and feed that back to the organizations, which then, um, over the co course of a couple more months, um, determined what their prior their strategic priorities for the initiative would be. So. Yeah, and and I, I somebody else somebody else in the cohort want to. If I can add, oh, well, sorry. yeah, go ahead, Maria Elena. While he's passing the mic to David, go ahead. Yeah, if, if I can add something uh, to that, uh, I mean, for Mujer, it was crucial to have that because we, uh, I mean, we're lucky that the women probably see our energy or trust us and follow us, but we realized that they didn't understand exactly what Mujeres was. So it was an eye opener. Again, the instincts and we keep going and they keep following us and, and working with us, and, and, and but not necessarily having the understanding so that's that was really important to us to see we need to be more clear in our message what is it that we do and so they know exactly when they have to explain it to somebody else so so it was really important yeah I, and i will just i'll just say this and then we have another question Did, yes. yeah i'll just say this we look back on it now and we say it was a success there were 141 we crunched the numbers it was hard to get people to do it <laughs> because they're busy because it's easier to keep moving forward rather than to stop and saying, who are we? But uh, as in all things, once people started it and they had insight about themselves, that was a very powerful tonic. Once they learned some stuff about their organization, the way people viewed them, that was very exciting and they wanted more. So, you know, as leaders, it's our job to, 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 to push and accept the fact that, that we're asking people to do challenging things but believe in the process. And I think it was a power, learning is a powerful tonic in my experience and, and, and that's what we did. One more question, I think. I just wanna um, appreciate what an amazing group that's come together on this project. It's really incredibly representative of our region and um, shows just great work from the foundation side and from Ken as a leadership to be able to identify and bring these folks together. Um, and I'd love to push on the analogy of the solar system oh. and the sun a little bit because it feels too passive to me to just define your orbit around this thing, the sun being the goal. Because what I feel I'm hearing is each of us is orbiting around this thing called our economy. Mm -hmm. And in that ray, we're not just orbiting around it, we are a part of it and mm. influencing mm. it. Mm. And what you've done by creating space for these oh, particles <laughs> to come together is to give them mass and to oh. influence then this thing at the center. So great. keep going. This is, this is great. Keep going. The metaphor grows. Keep <laughs> going. And it's really exciting to see the universe that you're creating. Nice. So nice. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Seth. All right. All right. Well, our time is up. For those of you who were curious about our work, we appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed our story. There's lots of contact information, uh, or there's, there's lots of information about us there. Feel free to reach out. I'd love to engage any of you. Thank you, all the SIDE folks, for investing so much in this. Thank you. And there is um, coffee break, snacks back on the other side, and we'll reconvene here at 3.30.